so um, in this other lecture, I will instead concentrate on the astrophysical aspects of binary neutral star mergers. And um, in particular, when you're thinking about retro, um, um, astrophysical uh, aspects, the, the most obvious are the electromagnetic counterparts, OK? So um, the most obvious and natural counterpart to a, a, a neutron star mergers are, of course, short gamma ray bursts. Okay? We know gamma ray bursts already since the 70s. They know we produce, they produce a release of enormous energies of the order of 10 to the 50 or 53 erg. Um, we know there are two families of bursts. There are those which are called long, those which are called short. Uh, the first ones are last tens of, of seconds or more. And um, we think they are due to the collapse of very massive stars. But this explanation cannot explain, or cannot be used to explain short gamma ray bursts that, take, that, that last one second or less. Okay? So you need something else. There's a time scale which is much smaller. And merging neutron stars are, are, are you know, the most reasonable explanations. In fact, um, this was an explanation which was proposed already in the 60s. And only now, with GW170817, uh, we were able to confirm that this prediction or this explanation is correct. So any time two neutron stars merge, they also produce a gamma ray burst. Well, any time. Most of the time. Uh, it, whether or not we see this gamma ray burst is a different matter. So if you want to study electromagnetic counterparts, there are essentially two different types of counterparts. One has got to do with the, those counterparts which are mediated by the presence of a magnetic field. And I'm thinking in particular to the presence to the formation of a jet. And then uh, there are other uh, counterparts which have to do with the kilonova emission. Are you all familiar with a, with a kilonova emission? What is a kilonova emission? OK. So the, uh, the logic is that the, uh, some of the matter is lost. As I've shown you, some of the matter is expelled. And this matter undergoes nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, radioactive decay. And when it does, it emits light. And this light is then seen later on in, 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 uh, as an electromagnetic counterpart. The light is over several wavelengths, mostly in the infrared. And you can predict rather precisely, if you have a good model, when there's going to be the peak of this emission and so on, and the fall off of this. So, but for the time being, I will concentrate not on a kilonova emission, but on the, uh, the presence of magnetic fields, OK? Now, most simulations use ideal MHD, which means infinite conductivity. And in this case, the magnetic field is advected. And then, you know, even in this simple scenario, uh, you can ask yourself some simple questions. Can these magnetic fields be measured during the spiral? Is an electromagnetic counterpart produced before the merger? Can we see light before the stars merge? Do magnetic fields grow after the merger and yield an electromagnetic counterpart? Does a jet appear after black hole formation and yield an electromagnetic counterpart? Now, these are very simple questions, okay? Basic questions, yes or no. And they are yet incredibly hard to answer. In fact, I don't think we can answer any of these uh, reliably, maybe just the first one. And this is because the complexity of the system explodes when you have magnetic fields, and the computational resources to capture all of this complexity equally explode. So for the first question, is the only one that we really can assess with a certain a certainty, and the answer is no. Okay? I will explain why this is the case. Can we see light before they, they merge? Um, the answer is maybe. The luminosity, there is a possibility that the two stars, in particular the magnetospheres, interact and through reconnection produce light. But the amount of energy that you produce through this reconnection is very small. It's order 10 to the 42 erg. And so is, is, you know, considering these are cosmological distances, it's very hard to see them. Um, do magnetic fields grow after the merger? This is certainly yes, I would say. But we don't know how much. Our simulations are uncertain whether there is an amplification that goes between a factor 20 or a factor 1,000 or more. 
What is clear is that the stars that will merge will have a low magnetic field, where low is really relatively low. Something of the order 10 to the 10 Gauss, maybe 10 to the 11, not magnetar strength. This is because uh, these are old neutron stars that have been orbiting for millions of years. They are cold, they have lost uh, part of their uh, magnetic field through ohmic dissipation. And if you go from 10 to the 10 and you want to reach magnetar strength, 10 to the 16, there is some amplification mechanism that needs to be there and it's not clear. And does a jet appear after black hole formation and yields an electromagnetic counterpart? The answer here is yes, if you think in terms of a jet structure and outflow, but it's unclear how to produce an actual uh, uh, ultra-relativistic outflow, okay? So we think we know how to produce something that looks like a jet, but we don't really know how to produce something that in this structure that moves at, uh, at relativistic speeds. So let's see, what happens when two neutron stars collide? We need to solve the, the, the answer in this equation together with those of magneto -adronomics. This is something already mentioned yesterday. Your energy momentum tensor, that fluid part will gain a part coming from the electromagnetic fields, and you will have to solve additional equations, which are essentially the Maxwell equations. I've written them over here in the way we solve them in practice. We have auxiliary fields to, uh, to improve the conservation of the divergence conditions. Now, let's try and answer the first question. Do, can we see in the gravitational waveforms the presence of a magnetic field? And what you can do to convince yourself is you can carry out two simulations with and without magnetic fields and then comp compare the, dif the, the different waveforms. So this is what's done in this work over here. In black, you have a, a binary with a 10 to the 12 Gauss magnetic field. And in red, you have no magnetic field. And it's hard to imagine, but the two waveforms are on top of each other during the spiral. They start to differ after the spiral, and you can see there is a phase difference. And th this is true, that is, that you don't see a difference during the spiral. Also, if you, if you change the mass, if you have a large mass, you see that, again, with a magnetic field of 10 to the 12, you see no difference. The reason why this is so, it's rather simple to, ex to explain. The magnetic energy associated with a 10 to the 12 Gauss is a small contribution, maybe one part in a million, to the binding energy of the system. And so you d because the binding energy of the system is what regulates the emission of gravitational waves, a modification of one part in a million is not going to be visible in this, um, in this plot. So the answer is that the influence of magnetic field is unlikely to be detected. Even if you have maybe hundreds of cycles, the difference is going to be so minute that it's going to be very difficult to determine this. And in particular, whatever you determine will be degenerate with uh, the tidal deformability and the equation of state. So hence my conclusion is very unlikely to be detected for realistic fields. However, the way you do this properly is not by checking equation, uh, checking waveforms by eye, what you can do is you can calculate what is called the overlap. Essentially, this is a normalized scalar product between the power spectral density in a gravitational wave form with a given magnetic field, Hb1, and with a different magnetic field. And then you normalize with the, 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 the norms of the two density. So you can, the scalar product is computed in this way. You take essentially power spectral density uh, in the frequency domain computed with a given magnetic field and another magnetic field. You deconvolve with this, this, the sensitivity of the instruments and you obtain this color product. Okay? So this is a number, because it's normalized, it's a number between 0 and 1. It, 1 would correspond to a perfect overlap. There is, the two waveforms are identical. Uh, 0 would be they are completely different. Okay? And then you can plot this overlap as a function of the magnetic field strength. And what you expect is shown in, uh, what, uh, what you find and is expected is shown in this diagram over here. So the overlap is essentially one unless you go to super duper magnetic strength over the order 10 to the 17 Gauss, which as I mentioned, are not expected to be produced. And you can see that you start seeing deviations from one only if you reach 
values of the order of, of uh, 10 to the 15 uh, Gauss, okay? So uh, the, the conclusion is that the overlap is always larger than 0.999 for magnetic field less than 10 to the 17 Gauss. And therefore, uh, it's very hard to detect magnetic fields during the spiral. Um, so let's try and answer the second question. Does a jet form? Okay, now uh, if you've done any plasma physics, you know that if you have a large scale magnetic field, then uh, e there is a possibility of producing coherent motion along those scales. And so if you want to have a jet, you have first have to produce a magnetic structure that allows for plasma to flow along this jet structure. So people have looked already a few years back, what happens when magnetized stars collide? And this is summarized in this simulation over here, where I take two stars with 1.5 solar masses and 10 to the 12 Gauss. I'm showing you two different quantities here, two scalar quantities. One is the density, and the other one is the magnetic field strength, and uh, with two color codes. If I show you both of them on the same star, you would be completely confused. You would just see a lot of colors. So what you have to imagine is that there is a wall here, and on one side of the wall, I show you the magnetic field, and on the other side of the wall, I show you the density. It's always the same binary, and the star just changes color when you go from one to the other. Now, what you see happen is that as the merger takes place, there is a very large outflow of matter. See, this is matter which has very low density, but very high magnetization, very strong magnetic field. And um, I don't know if you can appreciate, but there is an horizon here, there is a sphere. So at this time, a sphere, a, a, sphere, a, a black hole is produced. And so it's hard to deduce from this simulation only that there is anything different happening in the case of magnetic field. Yes. Well, it, 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 it has a, a large magnetic field at the beginning and is, um, it, it is ejected, and so it's a low density and, and, and has the property of being, you know, so it doesn't, it's, it's not extra magnetized. It's magnetized just like the rest, but it has the, the feature that is very light, has low density, and so can be ejected more easily. So if you want to have a look at some snapshots, uh, of, of this stage, you can see it over here. So this is the, during the spiral. You can see the magnetic field lines is nicely dipolar. This is at the merger. You still have a core, a, a, a global uh, coherent magnetic field. And then there is the hypermassive neutron star stage where the magnetic field is all tangled up because, um, because of the high conductivity of our simulations. So um, the magnetic fields in the upper mass neutrons have a complex topology, and the dipolar fields are completely destroyed. Whatever you start with, you're going to mix it up later on. What you can do is you can carry on this simulation longer, for longer times, and this is what we did. And what you see is that the system tends to arrange itself. There is a black hole. This means that there is a region where matter can fall because there is no centrifugal support. And as it falls, it will uh, just elongate magnetic field lines. It will stretch magnetic field lines, producing a, a structure over here, jet structure. You see also that the magnetic field becomes white. This is because there are instabilities in the torus that would lead to a growth of the uh, magnetic field. Okay? So if you look at this picture then in terms of snapshot, what you see is shown over here. You see that uh, there is a black hole which is formed. Uh, magnetic field is produced in a toroidal manner in the, in the disk. And if you wait long enough, there is a, a jet structure, which is dipolar. And this is produced by plasma falling onto the black hole. So instead of plasma flowing out of the black hole, the plasma falls onto the black hole. And this is because of the limitations of the simulation. But what is important is that you produce something that looks like a jet structure. So you can think this is like a pipe. And in this pipe, we don't have enough energy to, to let the, 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 the fluid in the pipe move. However, if we can inject energy in this pipe, then we would have steam in a pipe, and this would move at very large speeds. How do you inject energy into this pipe? Well, there are many different ways. Magnetic reconnection is one, neutrino uh, uh, Annihilation is another one, probably the most likely one. 
So what is interesting is that if you look at the bulk properties of this simulation, you look at you know, the production of a black hole of 0.8, a torus of about 6% of a solar mass, an accretion time scale of about 3 seconds, 0.3 seconds. These are bulk, and if you look at the energy released by the system, you realize that all of these checks uh, well, ma matches well what is the expectation from a short gamma ray burst. So this is not a short gamma ray burst simulation, but just shows that if you do include magnetic fields in the, in the picture, then you have that many of the missing links uh, are, are found. Um, I'll just show you magnetic field lines so you can have an idea. This is the upper massive neutron star. It's just a mass of spaghetti. Uh, a black hole is formed. This is a rotating black hole, so it can set some order into the system. And if you wait long enough, this is the order it has set. You see there is an order magnetic field in the disk because the torus is rotating, and there is this dipolar magnetic field in the polar regions. Other people have done similar simulations that you can see over here, and you know, pretty much with different flavors and, and different uh, topologies, but all confirm the idea that you can produce a jet. There is just one group in Illinois that claims to have also an outflow. No other group has found such an outflow, and it's not clear whether this is uh, something that has to do with the way the simulation is carried out, which is most likely the case. Um, I don't think I have time to go over this in too much detail. You can go beyond ideal MHD. You can do resistive magnetodynamics. What happens is shown in this case over here. So the resistive magnetodynamics is the ability to trace and, and track a release of energy through reconnection. This is density. This is magnetic field. Um, have a look at this panel in particular when a black hole is formed. You will see that a lot of the matter that is hanging around here in the polar region, without having any more support, without being pushed by the upper mass neutron star, will have to collapse to a black hole. And when it does, it will evacuate this region over here. And by doing so, we'll also produce a, a very nicely or organized and, uh, jet structure, which is the, similar to the one I was showing you before. It's just that here, this jet is even more regular because all of the resistive effects allow you to remove the little wiggles that you can see um, because of turbulence. So this is a comparison uh, side by side of an ideal MHD simulation and of a resistive MHD simulation. You see there is a lot of uh, small scale turbulence and all of this is wiped out by the resistivity in, in the system. Okay? So, uh, we don't know what is resistivity in these scenarios. It might be that it's extremely small, certainly smaller than what we used here, but this is an, uh, you know, the only example that I know of where people have looked at resistive simulations and have shown that, again, you produce a jet. Okay, I don't want to go into this. Um, let me touch upon uh, ejected matter and nuclear synthesis. Um, so already in the 50s, um, nuclear physicists have, have tracked the production of heavy elements in stars via nuclear fusion. There are beautiful papers that have gone through all of the detailed nuclear reaction chain to explain how star produces all the, all the various elements. And what they've concluded is that heavy elements with, a, with a, a mass number, atomic mass number larger than 56 cannot be produced in stellar interiors but they have to be synthesized during a supernova. Okay? So the idea is that stars produce elements in their interior, but then the very heavy elements, larger than 56, they cannot be produced in stars because they would be buried in stars. There are some processes that tend to dredge these elements out of the stars, but this is a very inefficient mechanism. If you want to explain heavy elements in the universe, you need to invoke something that takes these elements out of stars. Well, supernova sounds like the right thing to do. And, uh, and this was seen as a standard explanation for heavy element nucleosynthesis. However, simulations, supernova simulations, have shown that temperatures and energy are not enough to produce very heavy elements, so elements with atomic number larger than 120. They can produce between 156 and 120, but how you produce very large elements it remains uh, a problem. Up until you think, well, wait a second, all you want is neutron-rich material, which is uh, produced. 
In the case of supernova, you produce neutron-rich material at the end when you produce a, uh, a neutron star. But what if you have two star, neutron stars, and you collide them? You already have neutron-rich material from the start. And that is why neutron star merger seem a perfect candidate to explain the abundance of these elements over here. So what we can do with simulations is shown in, 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 in this um, other simulations. I'm showing you density um, and the projection of the density on three different planes. I, I take out all the spirals so that you can concentrate on this. Now I sprinkle a little bit of particles around and I let them evolve. And some particles will be go back onto the uh, neutron star. Others will be instead ejected to large distances. And so this is uh, what we can do nowadays. We can take all of these particles, these tracers, and we can evolve them to very large distance, keeping track of how much they change in temperature and density. And um, you, know, you can study a lot of things. You can study the, how, what is the composition, what is the electron fraction. Um, you can also study what is the, the velocity distribution, the entropy distribution. Uh, so this is shown over here, that this is the energy at infinity. You can also show where is it that most of the matter is emitted, is lost. This is shown, this is a, just a flux of the matter at different angles, and you can see that most of the matter is actually lost in the uh, equatorial plane and very little in the polar regions. This is what is typical of dynamical ejecta. Anyway, what you can do is um, take this ejected matter and, 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 and then use it to, to study nucleosynthesis. I should say that this, what I've shown you, is one of the possible channels of producing ejecta. This is a dynamical ejecta. There is a secular ejecta which happens on time scale much, much longer and has different properties. In particular, if you want to see the difference, this is shown in this other cartoon over here. Um, this is the distribution of ejected matter before the collapse of the upper massive neutron star to a black hole. You have essentially two components, one which is red because it's very neutron rich, so as a, an electron fraction less than 0.2, and a blue component which is instead uh, rich in electrons, and so an electron fraction larger, up to 0.3. This part is produced mostly in, in the equatorial, sorry, the red is produced mostly in the equatorial plane. As I've shown you, it's what I was showing exactly in that movie. While the blue part comes from um, you know, the polar regions over here. The blue part also has a larger velocity, while the red part doesn't have very large velocity. This object, as I explained, will collapse to a black hole and a torus, and this will produce a jet. This jet will have to go through all of this material that is produced. Note also that when the uh, black hole is produced, essentially the, the blue ejector is shut off, and you just have red ejector which is produced. Okay? I will come back to this plot later on. But um, what you can do is um, you can calculate what is um, you can take the information you have from this particle and hand it over to codes that calculate all the nuclear reaction uh, chains and then come up with abundances. And this is what is shown in this plot over here. So this is uh, the, the atomic mass number A versus the abundance, the relative abundance. Um, and you can see there are elements like cesium, barium, lanthanide, europium, and then you also have gold over here. Okay? So the dots, the circles, are the uh, observational data from uh, solar abundances. And as you can see, the, the, both this peak and this peak are reproduced extremely well. The different curves are different masses for a given equation of state. And you can see that you know, it doesn't really make a whole lot of a difference what mass or mass ratio you use. You always equally well reproduce this distribution. Of course, you are pretty bad over here. But that's not so much of a problem, because we think supernova can produce these elements. And this is extremely robust. You can change the equation of state, and this is shown with these different curves, and you obtain an equivalently good match to the observations. And this is why we believe, and as I mentioned at the beginning, that most of the heavy elements are produced by binary neutral star mergers. Now, there is this 
tantalizing thought that GW170817 produced 16,000 times the mass of the Earth in heavy elements, and just in, 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 uh, in gold and platinum, about 10 Earth masses. So if you are looking for gold, you know where to go and get it. Uh, might be difficult, but. Um, when I was a student, I was told we, were, we are stardust. Um, because you know we are produced by the explosions of stars. Actually, I think that sentence needs to be corrected. We are also neutron star dust. Um, once you have this capability, you can study you know everything. As I explained, you can study the, the spatial distribution of. Um, so this is the ejected mass. You can see some equations of state have a lot of ejected mass. Some have less ejected mass. Some have very little ejected mass, and that's because this object produces a black hole. You can study the distribution of uh, uh, the electron fraction. You can see that on the equator you have mostly blue. That means that you have very neutron-rich material. This is all something that uh, I have explained. And the Kilanova emission is, as I said, ejecting matter undergoes nucleosynthesis. Uh, when critical density and temperatures are reached, under, the matter undergoes radioactive decay, and this produces this Kilanova emission. You can predict what is the, the maximum of this emission as a function of time in different observational uh, bands. This is simulations. These are the observations. Of course, you know, they look similar in the time scale, but if you look at them more closely, they are not so good. The reason is that um, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty in this modeling. And of course, you know, uh, in particular, we don't know much about the opacity of these elements the, the, to, 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 to these photons. And this really changes a lot the time and the decay time of, of, of the light curve. But what you, know, you can take home as a message is that uh, the fact that GW170817 produced a kilonova closes the, the circle. We have seen from the same object both gravitational waves, a gamma ray burst emission, and a kilonova emission. All of this is consistent with the picture that whenever two neutron stars merge, you produce a gamma ray burst and a kilonova. OK. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm told that I should stop here. Uh, the, the, there is just, um, maybe I, I will just go very quickly without making the arguments. You see, um, this is the signal of GW170817. This is uh, the signal in the uh, gravitational wave detectors. And then this is the signal when it first appeared in the electromagnetic detectors, in particular in Fermi. So as I explained, we don't see the actual f uh, firework when the stars collide, because the signal becomes too weak. And then we see the signal again 1.74 seconds later. Now, for me, this is unacceptable. There is 1.74 seconds where I don't know what happened. And I need to know what happened. <laughs> and so um, I asked a few collaborators, so what happened between 0 and 1.74 seconds? And um, well, you know. The standard law is that it must have produced a black hole. Why is that? Because we see a gamma ray burst. And as I told you to me, gamma ray burst means black hole, because there is a jet. OK, and then I said to my collaborators, well, it can't be too difficult to calculate when it collapsed. And neither, because you have two constraints to satisfy. If it collapsed too early, then it would not have ejected enough matter and we would not have seen such a bright kilonova. So we know how rapidly you can lose matter. We know how much matter has been lost. So we have a constraint on how, how long it has been alive in order to expel all of that matter. On the other hand, it cannot have collapsed too late, because if it collapsed too late, there is a lot of material that you have ejected. And the jet has to make its way through all of this material. So the longer you wait, uh, the less time the, uh, the jet has 
to go through all of this material. Imagine that the black hole collapsed at 1.73 seconds, okay? Then obviously the jet would not be have enough time to go through all of that material. So you have two constraints you have to play with. Uh, and I will, I will not go through all the, I will just give you the, uh, the final answer. So one constraint comes from the ejected mass, okay, and is this dash, uh, this shaded region over here. Another constraint comes from the uh, electromagnetic delay, or if you want, from the jet breakout time. And it's, uh, so this is a huge uncertainty. This is uh, it's also a huge uncertainty, but less so. And so at the end of the day, what you obtain is that in our best expectation, about a second after the, the two star merge, they produce the black hole. Okay? So no one can possibly, uh, well, okay. There's going to be quite a long time before someone can object this number. It's reasonable. Uh, the reason why no one can object is that it's very hard to do simulation that run for such a long time. Um, but this is interesting because it tells you that um, we, you can create a direct connection, a correlation between the ejected blue mass, which you can measure, and the time of collapse. So my uh, conjecture is that if you look in the future detections at how much ejected mass is in the blue band, then you can tell easily what is the collapse time. Um, one of the problems that is raised by this conclusion, uh, so I would have liked it to be 0.1 second because then I didn't have to explain uh, such a long survival time. But one second is hard because the object uh, essentially doesn't lose um, gravitational waves over this time scale, and yet um, you have to, to produce sufficiently uh, large energy to still eject all of this matter, which means that you need a large magnetic field of the order 10 to 16 Gauss. And how do you produce this magnetic field is, goes back to the previous question I was mentioning before. We don't know how to amplify magnetic fields. Okay? So anyway, this is a, an amusing uh, result if you want. About one second after uh, the merger, uh, GW170817 probably produced a black hole. Okay, so let me uh, recap this part. Mergers naturally lead to electromagnetic counterparts, either in terms of GRB or a kilonova. Magnetic fields are unlikely to be detected, but they are important, very important after the merger because they lead to instabilities and counterparts. Counterparts and a jet are likely to be produced, but the details of this picture are still far from being clear. Mergers lead to tiny but important eject matter and a macronova emission. And this high atomic number nucleosynthesis is very robust. There is very little dependence on the equation of state and mass ratio. In fact, we can even take eccentric mergers and they produce pretty much the same abundances. And um, as I've shown, there is a first constraint on the lifetime of GW170817, which is about one second. Thank you. Maybe a couple of quick questions. Yeah, sorry. Uh, do we expect those learned neutron stars to try to align their magnetic fields while merging? No. Again, um, the in, so for this to happen, you need some exchange of, 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 of torque between the two magnetospheres which means that you need large magnetic fields so that the torques can be large, okay? And, and besides, you know, the binding energy is really the, the driving um, source of the dynamics. So for the same reason, you don't expect that to happen. Yes? How is this an independent of the um, That's a good question. Um, Normally, um, when you have to come up with the, 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 the initial data, so um, you have to have a guess about what is the, the, the rotational status of the stars. And because we don't know, what we assume is the simplest possible scenario, because we can, you can treat this analytically, and it is that the stars are in an irrotational configuration. Okay? So they have no, uh, essentially are non-spinning. But we expect the stars to be spinning, and in particular to have spins 
arbitrarily oriented. The amount of spin is a matter of debate. We don't know what is the spin of the stars prior to merger. But the most reasonable assumption is that they are low, low spins. Because again, these are all neutron stars. They have spun down because of dipolar emission. And so the spin is, is small. If you consider a small spin into this picture, then this picture doesn't change much. If you start putting in large spins, then the picture can change. In particular, a large spin can change the amount of ejected matter, can change the lifetime of the upper mass neutron star, can, yeah, um, can change the frequency of the post-merger or not, not significantly. So to summarize, spins are important if they are large. We don't think they are large. OK, I think you are tired. Oh, no. Ms. Kilo, what business are we always expecting a Kilo Nova and Gamma reverse in this neutron star, neutron star merger? We do. We do. But the Gamma reverse emission might not be detectable by us. OK? So while it is reasonable to expect that when we see a gravitational wave emission, we may see also a Kilo Nova, Seeing the gamma is not guaranteed because the gamma is highly collimated and only the fraction of gamma rebirths pointing to us will be visible. The kilonova is much more isotropic as a mission, and so you would expect it. However, and this is where uh, it's a bit unfortunate, if you've seen the gamma, then it's easy to see the kilonova. If you are looking for the kilonova just because you think you know where the uh, merger was, it's much harder because kilonova emission is much fainter. Also, these uh, white dwarf systems, do we expect some kind of kilonova from them? I don't think so, no, because the, 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 the chemical composition of white dwarfs is not neutron rich enough to produce this nucleosynthesis. Okay. Thank you.